Kanye West. Um, Kanye West, who has had a, a troubled... Um, He's having a difficult time. I, the other day, uh, Jason, I was watching the Chappelle show. I was like binge watching it because I was, you know, couldn't sleep. Of course, old school Chappelle. Old school Chappelle. This was from okay. two thousand four, I think. Wow. This was, yeah, this Has is an it old been show. That long? It, it, it was on. I mean, the Chappelle show was on. I want to say from the early, early two thousands or late nineties. Wow, time is flying. Yeah, and so I was watching this old show, and it was like, and Kanye West was like in a few of the episodes. He was the musical entertainment, right. most deaf, him, like you know, all of the great rappers from that era. And Tribe Called Quest. Tribe Called Quest. They were I all remember. on there. De La Soul yes, was in on one. I remember. And, you know, he's like vibing with, you know, like Common. Back when Common used to be Common Sense. Remember, Common used to be called, called Common That's Sense. That's right. Right. So I those, used to love her. Those of us back in the, oh, oh, you know, old school people know he was called Common Sense. And there was one where he even collaborated with Kanye. It's like, I, it's like, wow. That's what, those were the days when I was a huge Kanye fan. Like, I, I was a genuine Kanye fan. I know you were less of a Kanye fan. I was always a You were never a, really a Kanye fan. I was never fan. really a Kanye But fan. I was. I mean, I always thought he was one of the greats. Like, if you ranked, like, the top ten rappers, right, I would put him. I would definitely, I mean, obviously Biggie, Tupac, Jay-Z. It's so funny because I never put him in that category. You and I used to have arguments about that all the time. All the time. Yeah. yeah, Tribe, Tribe Called Quest, and De La Soul. Like, those are my two favorite, like, groups. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of great hip-hop artists, right? But um, I wasn't a fan. Yeah, but uh, the roots, you Still know, I mean, the roots are incredible. Like, there's just so many great artists, um, you know. But I always thought that Kanye was one of the greats. Um, I even put a chapter, like, I actually titled a chapter um, called Kanye in my very first book. Um, um, you know, uh, that was that was that was about his confrontation with you were hoodwinked. George that W. Bush. Remember when he said George Bush does not care about I black remember. people? Like that was a moment. Ended I, I did Mike, a whole book chapter on he it. He ended Mike Myers' career after that, actually. Well, Mike Myers kind of did fade away after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was my, that was in Fracture, if you feel like buying yet another book. Because this is a books podcast, I might as well sell another book. Hey, why oh, not? I've had it's three called of them. What to Read. Yeah, it's called What to Read. So What to Read would be the book called Fracture, which also has a chapter called Kanye. But anyway, Kanye West has morphed since then into something completely different. Um, he's a Trump fan. His family are very Trump adjacent. Um, apparently, um, you know, his wife um, is like buddy buddy with like Jared Kushner and Ivanka, and then she like was pulled into doing this criminal justice stuff by Van Jones and others, and that, that's a whole crew that makes no sense to me because they're also kind of adjacent to Jay Z, but like Jay Z's like not touching that at all. You never like I would be you would never see Jay Z like in the White House, like right trying to be near Trump. But Kanye's like all up in Trump's face, like yay Trump, like he's a Trumpy. Okay, so we know that. Um, we know that, you know, Caitlyn Jenner was a big Trumpy in 2016, which is ironic because, you know, it's not like Trump is for Caitlyn's community, but, you know, there there we go. Um, so we know that, there, that he's a Kanye adjacent figure and he's a pro-Trump figure and has been a pro-Trump figure, although it's not clear what his deal is now. Kanye West is now claiming he's running for president. Um, which he hasn't filed. He didn't file in most of the states and missed the filing deadlines in most of the states. But what's happening is you're seeing Republican operatives try to help him get on the ballot all over the country. And he's gotten on the ballot so far in Ohio and Illinois, uh, neither of which he's going to make a difference in. Those are both states that are going to go the way they're going to go. Illinois will go for the Democrats. Ohio will go for the Republicans. It's just the way it is. You know, Ohio actually might be in play for Biden. You never know, um, depending on who he picks. But, you know, bottom line being, He's not on the ballot in most states that matter, that are actually swing states. But there are two states where he's actually got a chance to get on the ballot that actually could be a problem. And by the way, he's admitted in an interview that he is running to siphon votes away from Joe Biden. He says he's running a faith-based campaign. Did you campaign. expect anything less? No, because he's gotten like two and a half million dollars from the PPP under Trump. Like he's made money under Trump, That's right? That's the whole point. And he's also bipolar. And so he's not, his wife. And um, he has no shame. Well, right, and, and and you know his missus, you know Kim Kardashian has put out there that he's suffering from mental illness and that he's which you know, is tragic, but which is wow. tragic, and that's one of the things that's happened to him since his mother died. He's been suffering from mental illness, so that is what she says is that part of this is mental illness, and that the family can't stop him from doing what he's doing. I've already not even in the country on the day of recording this, but he's but you still have Republicans who are willing to use him. And I think use and abuse him because of the, his mental status that, you know, he's for it, apparently. They've, they've got a running mate for him, and they're trying to get him on the ballot because they know that Joe— They have a running mate for him. Who is yeah, the they? Yeah, they've added a running mate. Uh, Who's the they? Republicans. Oh, wow. Okay. So, the, so Republicans are now trying to get him on the ballot in all these states because they know that Trump really can't win on his own. He needs help. He needs Russia's help. Who's his he running needs, mate, Kid Rock? 
No, no, it's a lady from Wyoming that's like a health, you know, religious, like health nutritionist or something. Um, she's like a religious person from Wyoming where he has a big ranch where it's he's been doing on. these mm-hmm. weird, like, um, church things where he's like made his own church. It's just, anyway, long story short, bottom line, Republicans are trying to get him on the ballot in states like, and the states where he's the most potentially dangerous to Biden are Wisconsin, where they're fighting to get him on the ballot, and now Colorado where he has now gotten on the ballot because Colorado has a very low threshold for getting on. But in Wisconsin, which is the state that most people are worried the most about of all the swing states, because the voter suppression in Wisconsin is epic. In in, in 2016, 200 to 300,000 people were kept off the ballot in Wisconsin because Scott Walker so rigged that state that even though now they have a Democratic governor, the state is so shot through with voter suppression. I believe it's still a Republican legislature and they do voter suppression almost as well as the South. Like they're almost like at Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina levels and North Carolina, which is the epic voter suppression state in Texas levels. Okay, outside the South, the state that does voter suppression with the most precision in America is Wisconsin. And here is where Kanye is now in a legal fight to get his name on the ballot because the signatures that were put in by Republican operatives to get him on the ballot included names, okay, signatures for someone named Mickey Mouse. You can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. So here is a thread by a guy named Mario Nicolais, who's a a lawyer, who has a Twitter thread, um, which is Mario Nicolais Esquire. Um, and here is what my, 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 uh, Mario Nicolais is, 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 is writing on his Twitter feed. Um, Kanye West, okay, this is an update. He calls it the Kanye con job. That's him calling that, him that, him calling it a con job. The attorneys for Kanye West filed his response to the two challenges filed against him at the end of last week. It is a treasure trove of jaw-dropping arguments. Let's start with the fact that it claims that Kanye West's campaign represents a uniting, inspiring, and faith-based vision that is successfully motivating disenfranchised and previously unengaged voters to participate in the political process. It would be funny if it weren't so insulting. Obviously, the characterization of the campaign is laughable, but the characterization of Wisconsin voters that they would be otherwise disenfranchised or unengaged is disrespectful and untrue, except they do get disenfranchised because of the government there. But anyway, it goes on. The response continues. People of color have long been marginalized in this country, seeking to remove Kanye West from the ballot. Complaints continuing continues the marginalization. So they're trying to claim that keeping him off the ballot would marginalize black people. Okay. Um, and by the way, um, there in this and he's right. This is astounding, an astounding claim given the seedy, potentially illegal connections between West's campaign and Republican operatives. It's obvious that West's campaign is a ploy precisely aimed at marginalizing and disenfranchising black voters. Ding, 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 ding. The Republican operatives propping up West know that voters of color will not support the current racist in chief. Again, this is Mario Nicolay's writing, not me. They hope West's campaign will draw enough votes away from Joe Biden that Trump can eke out a narrow win in a swing state like Wisconsin. And that is exactly true. And so that's why the attempt to put him on the ballot includes completely made up names, completely made up names. And you know the sad like thing Mickey about Mickey Mouse. It. I get that. You know the sad thing is that they really do think people of color are that ignorant to believe that we don't know what Kanye is doing. If he's already admitted it, so yeah. Do we do, do they really think we're going to vote for him anyway? I, I think that they think that people who just hate They're politics just are going to throw is. up their 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 hands and say, "I don't like Biden and and I don't like." Um, Trump, so I'm going to throw up my hands and vote for Biden. That's what they're hoping for. They're hoping to recreate what happened in 2016, except there's no Jill Stein this time, so they need to make a Jill Stein. Remember, what, Repu- what, what the Trump campaign needs to do in order to win is to precisely recreate the conditions that they had in 2016. In 2016, they had Russian help. Check. They're getting that again. They also, and but the public wasn't aware of it to the extent they are now, so it's not going to be as effective. Right. Number two, they need massive voter disenfranchisement, which statewide Republicans are doing their very best to make happen. Ding. The third thing they need is a third-party candidate that voters who are just feeling like it's all just BS can go to instead of voting for either of the two majors because third-party candidates are spoilers. Third-party candidates, if they can get enough momentum, can pull enough voters away to elect someone. Ergo, Bill Clinton 
gets elected in 1992 in part because Ross Perot is on the ballot. I and get Ross that. Perot gets 19% of the vote, and it allows Bill Clinton to squeak through with about 46% of the vote versus George Herbert Walker Bush. But that's okay? presuming that um, Donald Trump is going to win Michigan and Ohio again. I know, again. but what I'm saying is I in mean, a close maybe, election. No, a, I get it, but right. say the Democrats could pick up some states that they weren't, you know, they're not that's expected true. to win also and just nullify Wisconsin altogether. Maybe. That's what they, that's, a, that's a big ask, right? So so Democrats have to, how, how big of an ask would it be? I don't know, but, same day get North Carolina. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. But hold on. Let me just finish making this point before we move on to that. Then the thing is, is that if you think about that, if you think about the 2000 election, where, of course, a third party candidate who people will never, ever forgive, gets enough votes, just squeaks through in order to tip Florida over to George W. Bush. So it happens, right? Third party candidates can either be not important and just be written off or they can make a difference. Colorado is one of those states that goes by for Democrats by about five points. Wisconsin is a state that tended to go for Democrats, but that in the past, in 2016, you know, it had to happen since 1988, but it did go for Trump. So that's what they're trying to do. But yes, to your point, Jason, if Democrats can flip another state. And remember, Joe Biden's already won North Carolina on the ticket with Barack Obama. So in 2008, North Carolina actually did go to Obama Biden. So Biden, if you're a North Carolina voter, you've already voted for Joe Biden. And also, if you think of, and if you think in 16, what did Trump win by like 77,000 votes? In I those mean, three states combined. And that's with people not knowing that Trump, Russia was behind a right. lot of it. So I'm sure this time around, a lot of people are more educated about what's going on. And it may not work in Trump's favor this time. I'm it just assuming. It, it might not. And so, but the, you do have a lot more seats, more states on the table. You've got Arizona on the table, which looks like it's going Biden's way. North Carolina looks like it's going Biden's way. Florida, I never trust. I don't know. It's he's polling. Hey, I don't believe it. Uh, Texas, we're gonna uh, you know talk later on the on the on the 7 p.m. show on the readout to Beto O'Rourke, who is like really really bullish on the way Texas is going. But I don't know. Like some of these states are gonna take a while to jail. But it is interesting that you do have Wisconsin and the, and the Wisconsin uh, Election Commission on this Kanye thing are saying that Kanye West paperwork, which was filed to get him on the ballot, was filed late, literally 14 seconds after 5 p.m., which, which is the due time. And they're saying it's strict compliance, so it had to be on time. And so even if you're 14 seconds late, you can't get it on. And so that is why Kanye West attorneys have now gone to court. This is the same Wisconsin that made up voter suppression rules and now they want to change the same yes. rules that they made up? No, no, no. Wisconsin's not trying to change the rules. Wisconsin is standing up for its rules. Uh, Wisconsin okay. is saying... So Kanye shouldn't be on the ballot then, period. Correct. So And so they, Wisconsin is standing up for its rules. But what I'm saying is Kanye West is taking them to court and trying to get them to allow him to be on the ballot. So tick, 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 it's going to be very interesting. Um, now, beyond just voter suppression, you also have this other factor, which is that Donald Trump... Um, uh, who is, you know, running, he's sort of the other the other Kanye West, right? The, 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 the white male Kanye West um, that's running on the ballot. He's now kind of trapped because the thing that, that he's had in his, you know, little bag of tricks that has been the most useful for him across his little short presidential political career has been the Trump rally. The Trump rally has been the meat and potatoes that like, it's what, it's what binds Trump voters together. It's when they can all get together and yay it's their and church. right and listen to ironic music like you know um, like village people you know and which is ironic you know but and get sued for playing the Stones and stuff. So so the rallies have been shut down because of COVID. He's been he's been limited in this in the rallies he could do. He tried doing the Mount Rushmore thing. He did the, the Tulsa thing, but it's been very limited. We have an author on today that's going to talk about these rallies and what these rallies have actually meant to Trump and what they're like. Here's the thing. We have an author that's going to take us inside these rallies, um, and it's a fascinating book, so let's bring him in. It has been called Brilliant, Riveting, Funny, and Terrifying, and that's Liza Mundy, author of Code Girls, and that is uh, what's on the cover uh, of the book called Liar's Circus, A Strange and Terrifying Journey into the Upside-Down World of Trump's MAGA rallies, uh, and the author is New York Times bestselling author Carl Hoffman. Carl, thanks so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. All right, so take us inside of this because, you know, circus is the perfect word, I think, to describe what Donald Trump's whole 
political act feels like um, to those of us who are used to covering normal politics, right? Regular senators and governors and mayors and presidents, you know, it's never like this. Um, but you've added to the idea of circus that it's a liar's circus. Talk about these Trump rallies and what got you to decide to just follow them around and write about them? Well, you know, I live, uh, I'm a native Washingtonian and I, there are 63 million people who voted for Donald Trump and I didn't know any of them. I mean, honestly, I had a few friends on Facebook, but um, through one way or another, but really in my daily life, I had absolutely nothing to do with any Trumpians, yeah. Trump supporters on the one hand. And the other hand, I uh, had spent a lot of time over the last 10 or 15 years going to the ends of the earth, uh, living with the remote indigenous people for various stories. And it suddenly sort of occurred to me that it was strange. There was this whole world in my own world that I didn't know anything about. And the, I started thinking about that. And then the rallies, it was clear to me, were a unique phenomenon of Trump. Uh, of Trump himself. And, you know, he had over 400 by the time I started in October of 2019. And, uh, you know, he held, held them every week and he had them held them week in and week out. And I started to think that they were really the essence of an important piece to Trump and Trumpism. And they were the place where he seemed to reconstitute himself. So I thought, well, I would make a journey into my own country, into yeah. this place that, uh, of Trump rallies. You write, uh, and this is chapter three, which the title is interesting. It is, you must love Jesus more than your own life. And this is what um, you write here. I didn't know what to expect. Crowds, demonstrators, new revelations were coming out daily about the president's embrace of conspiracy theories in Ukraine and his subsequent effect, uh, effort to block congressionally approved military aid. There was talk of impeachment in D.C. The Democratic mayor of Minneapolis was threatening to withhold crucial security forces and first responders and unless the Trump campaign reimbursed the city and he'd forbidden the wearing of uniforms by police attending the rally as spectators. Um, I think what a lot of people sort of think about when they think about these Trump rallies is kind of angry um, conspiracy theorists, cops, <laughs> um, you know, people who all fall into the white working class category um, who are just angry that the country has changed and this is their chance to bond. Is that is that accurate as to what Trump rallies are like? Yeah, very much so. I mean, the funny thing is that at a Trump rally, the first thing that I thought, that idea of anger was something that I thought I would see right away. And instead, the first thing I saw was all of these people sort of united in this fantastic joy of being together, but it's an insidious kind of joy because it's a joy of exclusion. It's a joy of whiteness, really, and of, of demonizing the other and of being, you know, many people told me that the great thing about being at a Trump rally was being among people like themselves and that overwhelmingly is white people and it's overwhelmingly, you know, white, traditional white working class, uh, non-college educated white people. And, you know, it's this whole, as I say in the title, I mean, it's an upside down world. It's a fantasy world. It's this world in which all of these people who I think have a deep sense of the world, as you said, of change, of the world changing, of the ground shifting under their feet in terms of work, in terms of ideas of masculinity and gender, in terms of religion. And all these things are happening and they sense this uh, tremendous loss. And, you know, you go to a Trump rally and it's this big a uh, raucous, fantastic thing in which this guy comes out and he says exactly what everybody wants to hear. Yeah. Um, and it's totally false. I mean, it's it's total uh, upside down. I mean, you know, he comes out and he says, uh, you know, who's here is, uh, you know, is a union man. We're here for unions, even though, you know, the GOP has spent years since the Reagan years of uh, passing right to work laws, which are specifically meant to, to weaken unions. You know, you get these, these weird, uh, uh, incongruities like, you know, the most, there's incredibly loud music at a Trump rally. And it's, uh, you know, I thought it would all be kind of sappy country music, but it's not. It's like 
rock and roll from my youth. Um, you know, Rolling Stones. And the, one of the biggest songs of all is the Village People's YMCA. Yeah, I, and you, you, <laughs> you, you, you know, it's incredible. You, you can't make this stuff up. You get 22,000 uh, people, many of whom are uh, white evangelical fundamentalist Christians who are opposed to homosexuality, you know, who think being gay is a sin. And that song comes out and they all dance to it and they uh, mime the, the pantomime, the YMCA letters with yeah. their arms swinging and right before Pence comes out. I mean, here's a guy who won't even, you know, ha- have a, 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 a a meal with a, or be in a room with another woman without his wife, he says. I mean, you know, you get these these things and it's just, it's mind-boggling. Well, and, you know, on the, the subject of music, because it, it always, you know, we, I was speaking with um, the, the show team um, for, for the readout, and we were talking about the fact that it feels in a lot of ways like the songs that are played at Trump rallies are kind of a joke on the people attending, right? I mean, as you said, they're playing YMCA, which is a gay anthem, right? And oh, doing the song, or they and they keep getting sued by rock bands like the Rolling Stones, who say, "Don't use our music. Like, stop using the music that is mostly liberation music and liberation music that is tied to the 1960s and to you know the hippie movements and to the anti-Vietnam movement." They keep on getting sued by people who say, "Stop using our liberation music." For this, is that a thing? Do, do you sense that it was like a joke? Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, Rolling Stones are big, obviously, and yet you you know you think about Rolling Stones. I mean, here's this you know British here's this anti globalist playing music from a British band that's challenging you know Black Mississippi blues. Yeah. Um, you know, or Tina Turner is big. Here's this sort of this icon of feminist. Um, you know, black liberation, women's liberation, and, um, you know, all of these conservative Christian, you know, racists are celebrating that music. And that's, you know, I mean, the music is a good just example, an easy example, really, of how, you know, both how crazy and upside down it is on the one hand, but also how it's sort of, I mean, I say in the book that a Trump rally sort of grabs your soul. It tries to take it away. It, it, it reaches in and grabs your soul. And it's these epic, iconic songs that speak to people's, you know, a lot of older, you know, 50s, 60s, baby boomers um, generation and um, that have bitter, bitter, you know, that speak to their souls, but really have nothing to do with are completely contrary to Trump's policies and everything that he stands for. And it, and it, and the more you hear it, I, the more incredible it is. I think my very first Trump rally was in, in, in Minneapolis. And, you know, I hadn't really, wasn't quite sure what to expect. And, and I, I was bowled over right from the start by how much, how he was such a blatant liar and how he just, and that that was his power because, you know, if I, or if you or I say a lie, even if it's a white lie, you know, we can't go to the party because our grandmother's sick, but we really just don't want, you know, I feel guilty about that lie. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, Trump doesn't feel guilt at all. He'll say literally anything. And if, if you are such a liar, then, you know, you're just not held accountable to anything. Well, do you get the sense that the people that you talk to at these rallies are in on it? Do they understand that when he says he's going to drain the swamp, he's really saying, I'm going to give a lot of rich people money? Or that when he says, you know, no. I'm going to make a great health care plan, that he really means he's going to take away their Medicaid. Like, do they know he's lying or do they just not care? Neither. They, I mean, that's one of the incredible things about this country and in, you know, the state of the world right now, which is that, you know, there is a jumbotron that is set up in front of the line. The line can, people gather days in advance and, you know, it's 7, 7.30 a.m. The day of the rally, the jumbotron goes on and it's on an hour long loop and you've got all these people saying all this stuff. And there's this line, you know, Brad Parscale, who was his campaign manager, saying who's kind of an iconic figure or was within the rally ecosystem. And, you know, he says the single greatest threat to democracy is the press, is the fake news. And, 
you know, so these people are living in such an isolated bubble of misinformation and disinformation that people really don't, um, they don't know. I mean, look, there are a lot of people, when I say a lot of people, you know, Trump rallies are usually around 20, 22,000 or a smaller rally of 10,000. And of those people, you know, a huge number don't even watch Fox News. I mean, they, they, you know, they watch, oh, you know, One American News Network or no news at all. They get all of their news from the Internet. They say things to you, which is the worst thing to hear. When you hear someone says, say, I'm an independent researcher, don't be a sheep, which means they get their all of their information from Facebook and from Twitter. And, you know, they're in, invariably, you know, we're starting to see right now in a number of in GOP primaries in which these QAnon people are winning their primaries. And, you know, the reality is I thought, well, you know, these crazy conspiracy theories, you know, that's a, that's a minor uh, uh, chord among Trump supporters, but it's not. I mean, I would say 99% of people at a, at a Trump rally believe in one way or another in various conspiracy theories. I mean, you know, and that's, you, it becomes, you can't even have a conversation. I imagined that I would be making this journey through Trump world and I would be having these substantive conversations with my fellow rally goers and we'd talk politics yeah. and you can't, you couldn't talk to, you know, I'm talking to this, I met this woman named Christine in Dallas about my age. She seemed like, I mean, I liked her. She was a reasonable sounding woman. And then we're talking initially in line. We ended up sitting next to each other at the rally. Yeah. And she said, I said, you know, the thing that really surprises me is how many people, um, believe in these conspiracies and she sort of laughed and she so, started telling me about how uh John, jfk jr you know had been killed probably a bomb had brought his plane down and she said you know hillary i don't know i don't have 99 friends who committed suicide and i, I was like well, you know what what you're talking about what she means is you know that the clintons have, have murdered all these people she said you know would i do i think hillary would kill to win absolutely Wow. Okay. And then, you know, I, 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 I arose, I, I arrived at, I started trying to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And so for instance, in Tupelo, Mississippi, which is my third rally, I got there about 54 hours before the rally. And I was sixth in line. I set my chair down, my camp chair in the rally, you know, two full nights before the rally and sat down. And, you know, very soon, uh, these guys are starting to tell me, well, do you know that Michelle has a penis? And I was like, I what? beg your pardon? What? <laughs> You know, yo, Michelle has a penis. And she's like, you know, I was like, come on. I, I mean, you know, what about the kids? They're like, there are no pictures of those kids. Those kids, you know, they were plants. And, and they're like, look, you go into Ellen, just Google Ellen, Michelle dancing with Ellen. And you can see it like minute five. And I'm like, I don't think so. So I Google it. I look at my phone. I mean, right there with them. And I look and, I, and I'm like, I don't see anything. And I say to them, I'm saying, I don't see anything. I don't see any penis. I don't, I don't see anything that looks like a penis. And they're, they're like, come on, Carl, look. And then they, you know, they get on their phones. And they look, they're like, there it is, there it is, minute, you know, 513, there it is, it's flapping. And I'm like, I, it, I, don't see, I don't see a penis. And that sounds crazy, like silly, but it's constant. Oh, it, and and it's God. inherently racist. You know, it speaks to this powerful racism that people feel about, you know, are always spouting about the Obamas. And these are people, mind you, who the minute you suggest anything about racism will we'll get angry and will say, you know, people are always accusing us of being racist, but we're not. So you, you write about the fact that, you know, as you said, it's an overwhelmingly white crowd at these Trump rallies. But you write, you know, they're always, of course, there were Latinos for Trump and Jews for Trump and blacks for Trump at the rallies. The handful of blacks were often used as literal stage props, purposefully seated behind the president so their presence would be captured on television. But the numbers of those groups paled in comparisons to the thousands of whites. You're right, well, I did see the occasional person holding an LGBTQ for Trump sign. Those, quote, others were celebrated and tolerated precisely because there were so few of them. They didn't have the power to demand anything. What did you make of and did you talk to a lot of the, the others that were at these rallies? 
<clears throat> well, I mean, I talk to some and inevitably when you talk to people at Trump rallies, you start hearing the same thing over and over and over again. I mean, yeah. people just repeat it. it. You know, I was always hoping that I would find find some really interesting, insightful, original thinking. And I, I hate to say it, but I never found it. I mean, even the you know, black Trumpers, they, they would spout the same thing. Oh, absolutely. Black Trumpers would be like, you know, we're tired of, of you know, being called, a, you know, ra- that I'm a racist or that Trump's a racist. And, you know, we've been, you know, black people have been held down by the Democrats and, you know, now, uh, you know, uh, we should be able to believe whatever we want. And so here we are. Did they, I mean, did they sense themselves as props? Because I think about Herman Cain, who passed away recently. He and a bunch of other Trump supporters um, showed up at this rally in Tulsa and they were and they were literally dancing around. The video of them of them all dancing makes me very uncomfortable, I have to say, as a black person, because they, they appear to be performing like for the camera, performing almost yeah. for the rest of the audience who all surrounded them. There were probably maybe like 14 of them and they're all there in the middle. And Herman Cain is sort of there off in the back and they're all dancing around and showing how jovial they are and how much fun they're having. And then later on, we find out Herman Cain has, has, has gotten COVID-19. He ultimately passes away. But to the very end, he stayed loyal to Donald Trump. He was completely reverential of Donald Trump. And it's almost like he died for Trump, right? Like there's, a, you know, we, I've interviewed people who are experts, including on this podcast, in, in cult behavior, in personality cults. And the difference between a religion and a personality cult, of course, is that in a religion, in many uh, religions, whether Western religions or Eastern religions, the savior might die for you. But a, a personality cult is is when you might be asked to die for the savior, right? And so there is a weird thing that happens with even black people who get pulled into this. What do you make of that? Because Herman Cain had his own profile. He ran for president himself. And yet here he was, another sort of prop Honestly, for Trump. Honestly, I, I can't explain it. I mean, I have, I, I really, I'm at a loss for words. Of it. You know, my very first Trump rally, I got to Minnesota, to Minneapolis the day before the rally. I didn't really know what was what. And I just went to scope it out, to sort of reconnoiter. And I found the head of the line that was already forming. And, you know, there were about 30 people there. And one of the one of those 30 people was a black man in a stars and stripes baseball shirt and a MAGA red MAGA cap. And I was surprised. I mean, I was like, wow, that's so interesting. And then, then, and then I sort of just checked it all out and I went and, and, and uh, went to sleep and I came back before dawn the next morning. And of course I, the line had grown exponentially. There were a thousand people there already. And even walking past the line tr- to the end of it to find a place, I was surprised at the number of black people and people of color and most definitely surprised by the number of women. But, you know, it was sort of, I think I was surprised because I didn't expect to see any at all. And that then I realized that, and over time, you know, the more rallies I went to that, you know, that large number that I was seeing was really like a hundred or 200 people out of, you know, tens of thousands of people. So it really wasn't very many at all. And I, I really can't understand it that, you know, your idea, what you just said about sacrificing is really interesting because I, I went to all the, you know, gradually became hanging out with the, the, these biggest super fans, these people at the front of the line. And, you know, we would be the very first in, inside the rallies, but I always went, you know, it was exhausting. You're talking about days online, cold and rain and, and it's uncomfortable and it's exhausting and you get in there and I always went to a, to a seat, even a seat that was in very close, as close as you could get on the floor. But gradually, you know, but all my sort of buddies, the guys I was really hanging with, they wanted to go to the rail. They stood at the very front rail, like you're at a concert and they were like, Carl, you have to come to the rail. And finally I did. And, you know, that's after days of being in a parking lot and being cold and rained on. And then you get there at two o'clock, you've got to fight. You've got to hold your place at the front of the rally. And Trump might not come on till eight o'clock, seven thirty, eight o'clock. That's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, six hours. You can't really even leave and go to the bathroom or, or leave and get food because you'll, someone will take your place and it's suffering. 
And I had this feeling that we were suffering for him. And it was so much of religious, sort of extreme religious experiences are built on suffering. I mean, circling Mount Kailash on your knees if you're a, a Buddhist in Tibet, and that people were suffering for Trump. And that made me feel incredibly bad because I felt like I was suffering for him, but it was all empty. It left me feeling very hollow. So I, I mean, back to your question, I, I don't know. I wish I had a better explanation. You know, there are always outliers in every culture and and society, and I, I don't know how to explain it. You know, the, you, you do in chapter three, you do talk about, you know, the, the, the this chapter, you must love Jesus more than your own life. Is Christianity the through line that you found in all these rallies, that these people are white, mainly white, evangelical Christians, and that there's something about Trump that appeals to them. And if so, what? Because he is clearly not a devout Christian. Well, I mean, I think there are several things going on. I mean, one is just purely political. I mean, people are, um, they support Trump because he, you know, is opposed to a woman's right to choice and, you know, packing the Supreme Court with very conservative judges and those things. But I found that, Religion was a really, really big and powerful thing culturally. And I found that the I believe the rallies are exploiting a, you know, this deep vein in American culture, which is white Protestantism and this idea of, of uh, revivals and preachers and this, um, and Trump is playing the part of this sort of icon, American icon, of a uh, of a of a revivalist preacher. And you know, I said to Christine in Dallas, you know, I was taken aback by how brightly lit the rallies were. Like I imagined that the lights would go down and then a spotlight would come on Trump or something, and it that didn't happen they're 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 hyper lit there's no shadows in a in a trump rally and i said that to christine she said well it's church and she said you know this is we're here to you know he can see us and we can see him and i think you know we forget that there are certain really fundamental uh, American tropes, um, city on a hill and American exceptionalism. And those things are really, you know, Protestant Puritanist, you know, Puritanist um, concepts that were present in, in the founding of America. And they're really religious concepts and they speak to a certain you know, these chosen people who are these white Protestants who left Europe in, in favor of not just, uh, you know, religious freedom, but mercantile freedom. And that there are these, um, you know, reawakenings that have been really powerful, um, in Protestant culture and that those things are very, very, present in Trump rallies and are exploited by the rallies. And, you know, this whole idea of sort of dying and being born again in a rally. I mean, people faint, people pass out, people, not hundreds of them, but I saw people and, you know, in, I think it was in Bossier City, which is outside of Shreveport, you know, two people were carried out from the rallies. I watched them. Yeah. You know, and I wonder, Carl, um, having been to so many of these rallies and experienced it, and as you said, gotten to know some of these people, in your mind, what happens to them now that there are no rallies, right? Because now we're in the COVID-19 situation, the coronavirus situation, where they can't do this. Like, even when they try to do it, you get what you get in Tulsa. It's 6,000 people, not 20,000 people. They, he, Trump keeps trying to revive them. He did, like, a, a version of them at his New Jersey golf club where he just pulled in a bunch of his high roller donors and had them applaud for him so he could have, so he could have the feeling of a rally because he obviously needs it for his own psychological reasons, but he can't really do them the way he wanted to. What do you think happens to these people? Well, I mean, I think that the rallies are integral to his power and to his rise to power and that his, you know, the fact that he had, that, that, 
that he hasn't been able to hold any rallies since uh, COVID, uh, you know, we see the results. I mean, they're not singular in the sense that it's not the only reason, but I think through the rallies, Trump sort of reconstitute him, reconstitutes himself, his own sense of power. He goes into a place with 22,000, you know, screaming fans. I mean, there are moments of silence in a, in a rally and, the, and a voice will call out. It's always a male voice will call out, you know, I love you, which is incredible. This gruff male voice calling that out to, to this guy. And he is reconstituted, and I think he goes back to Washington and, you know, feels that power. And the flip side of that is that, you know, he is always stirring his his base up and they're coming to him and they're getting reconstituted him themselves. And that without that, he is just faltering. He's slipping. And a big thing that we haven't talked about is the way in which he um, dangles his, you know, it's incredible when he has a rally a large number of the local, you know, almost always the local politicians come. I mean, Cruz in Texas, Cruz was there. Um, Did you know, he bring his in, wife that uh, Trump called ugly? Uh, they, yeah, I've never seen Melania at a, at a rally. But, no, I mean, um, did Ted Cruz bring his wife? Because Trump called Ted well, Cruz's wife ugly. Well, I don't know, but I'll tell you the most amazing story. In Texas, you know, he gets up there and he starts calling these people out. And he says, uh, he tells a little story about that each person. And each story is really a humiliation of them and how he defeats them. And in Ted Cruz, he went on this whole big thing about how Ted Cruz was the debate champion of Harvard and of Princeton. And, you know, he was this, uh, you know, this, this big you know, elite guy and that Trump was a nobody really, but Trump had, had destroyed him, humiliated him. And, you know, Trump is up there on the dais and, and Ted is down below him and uh, people are screaming and he's laughing and he's like, ah, but Ted, you know, he's a good guy now. And Ted is under no, you know, he has to smile and take it, but it's well, human- he does it because he wants to. I mean, Trump, his, the self own of Ted Cruz, the fact that he just doesn't have any honor or any self, uh, he doesn't seem to have any pride, right? Because Trump can beat him. It's same with Rubio. Yeah, They're all, all like, beat guys. me, miss, miss, abuse me, abuse my wife, abuse my dad. Um, all I, all I have, of these guys, I have, same way. I have to also ask you about the, the, the violence at the rallies because the people who don't take it are the people who come there to protest and who Donald Trump makes a big show um, of, of, of fomenting violence against them and encouraging violence against them. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's funny. I didn't really see that much violence, yeah. really, certainly outside of the rallies. In Minneapolis, which is, you know, this, a very liberal city, there was probably the most. Um, but, you know, I got in the rally so early, and yeah. then by the time you get out, I kind of missed all of that. Yeah. Um, I saw a little bit of it in Lexington in Kentucky, there are demonstrators who, you know, get into the rallies. It's yeah. very easy. Anyone can go into a rally and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but there's a whole protocol. There's a lot of security, these big beefy, not secret service men. There are those two, but or agents, but these beefy kind of cartoonishly exaggerated, uh, mostly men with mohawks, shaved yeah. heads, a lot of tattoos, uh, boots um, and they there's this whole protocol you're supposed to you know kind of cover your put your sign over the protesters head and, right. and, and surround them and they lead them out and you know if you're not near a protester it could happen very quickly and then you don't really see it and yeah. then you know there are people tend to lash out as the security uh, leads these people out up the stairs people will try to lean in and punch them or something I feel like I never saw out and out violence and people were very, I mean, surprisingly open and, and uh, friendly to me yeah. and they, they, but I feel like the, the violence is more subtle in a way. It's a violence of a simmering exclusion and otherness and bonding over this exclusion and this demonization of others. And you sit there and you think, you know, what would happen if Trump said, go get him, you know, 
take them? What would happen then? And you know through history that that has happened. And so that's the the scary part to me. And this whole urge, you see it in the in the rallies, this this need to humiliate and to win and to uh, this sort of absolute urge toward authoritarianism. Yeah, and, I, and it's really, really clear. It's it, right. And, and I think I'm glad you use that term because I feel like that is what's scary about the Trump rallies and about the about Trumpism is that it attracts people who are less and less um, connected to democracy and more and more connected to authoritarianism and autocracy. And what really scares a lot of people is how many police officers are attracted to it. And police officers who then can put their badges and their uniforms and their guns strapped on and then can exercise that humiliation of other people with authority, right? Because that that is something that has always been, um, it's the same way the police were so attracted to Rudy Giuliani and during his era felt free to be more violent because they knew he had their back. And it it really freaks me out how many police officers are there. Did you see a lot of cops or, or encounter a lot of cops uh, off duty at these rallies? Um, well, mostly they didn't wear their, their, I mean, in Minneapolis, for instance, they're forbidden to wear their uniforms. So, you know, I wouldn't know necessarily. I mean, you definitely, I mean, law enforcement, military, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, any of those kinds of institutions, there's a lot of, or there has been a lot of support for Trump. But I think the thing that you, you know, that you have to remember is that, and that struck me over and over when I was in the rallies, is that, you know, we imagine evil to be something we see in the movies, like the Joker in Batman or the bad guy in a James Bond movie, who's kind of this this Hollywood caricature of evil, maniacally laugh, laughing and, you know, insane. And in reality, you know, uh, uh, authoritarians often take power through the law. They always say, they don't say we're destroying democracy. They say, as Trump does all the time, that we're supporting the Constitution and that we're supporting your rights by, uh, you know, maybe suspending the election or, you know, uh, uh, because of fraud, we're going to get rid of uh, mail-in voting. And there's always... And, 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 you know, people are, I mean, there's a, there's a scene in the book where I quote this uh, reporter who, who's rioting with, um, with Goebbels and some of the Hitler's men uh, in, the, in the 1930s. And, you know, he says they were as nice as can be to us. And they were smiling and they gave us whatever we want. But these were the men who some years later you know, destroyed uh, uh, people in a country. And, you know, all of those people who are up there on the stage with Trump and all of the supporters who are kind to me and saying, you want to, you know, can I get you a piece of pizza and, and, you know, love their children, just like everybody loves their children. They're going along with this. And that's what's frightening. Absolutely. Uh, Carl Hoffman um, is the author. The book is called Liars Circus, a strange and terrifying journey into the upside down world of Trump's MAGA rallies. Thank you for doing this um, so that we don't have to. Like You, you went in there uh, on our behalf. And um, thank you for these great insights. Really, really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate right. it. Cheers. Bye bye. All right, everybody. Thank you so much to Carl Hoffman, um, author of Liars Circus. Um, fascinating. Really fascinating. Fascinating how people can be duped into church. It's a weird church. I because, love church, but not that kind of church. Well, what's weird about it is that, you know, and, and when you combine, one of the things I love about the What to Read podcast is that we're sort of putting together a narrative here. It's right? like, you know, everybody, we, I'm, I don't mean to cut you off on it, but it's like everybody we put on so far that's talked about Trump, it's like they all come to the same conclusion. Right, and it's, it, it all, it, it it's pieces a together a narrative in that you do have this sort of cult-like following of Trump that is like an itinerant preacher kind of thing that he puts on, even though he himself is the most irreligious president he's a probably ever had. He's never ever ever been religious other than believing in the power of positive the power of positive thinking which is the only church like thing he's ever been associated with but it's fascinating how he's been able to put together this sort of itinerant preacher kind of thing that he does but it's fascinating and it's it's a it's a church that is revolves around this nostalgia for white protestant domination and i think you have to look at the through line between all the people we've talked to 
the the through line for all of it is a white Protestant religious um, fervor for him, but also a demand for that kind of return to domination that they want to dominate, dominate, dominate. They want to dominate the country, the culture. You know, I even think wanting to play that music, it's about recapturing the culture and dominating other people. But anyway, it's an interesting thing. So Carl Hoffman, thank you very much. It's a very interesting book. Great interview, um, great interview, Joy. Thank you very much, thank you very much. All right, so uh, join us for more um, uh, What to Read episodes, but please give us a, a like. Um, if you like this, if you're watching it on YouTube, we need to build our subscriber account. Yeah, and Let's you should subscribe. Let's get to two thousand. Let's get to two thousand. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, subscribe, 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 subscribe on YouTube, so you can actually see my face. Uh, or you can also subscribe on Spotify. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts. So subscribe to the podcast. You can also do it on Lipson. Hit the notification. Hit bell, the notification. So you know when a new episode is coming out. Absolutely, you don't want to miss a single episode because not the episodes one. are great. I mean, come on. Very good. How do you not like this? So please subscribe. Uh, hit the notification button. Give us some comments. Give us some feedback. Let us know if there are other books you'd like us to read. But for now, everybody, thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Jason. You're very welcome. All right. Talk to you later. See you guys on the next one to read. Bye, fam.